Copy data management is, for many organizations, a large and growing problem. Most of your data is a copy. Production is some amount of that. You at least have operational recovery sitting in a backup system. You probably have an HA copy sitting available to your applications. You probably have a DR copy. You may be repurposing that work into dev and QA environments. You may have an analytics copy of it. You may be doing e-discovery against it. There are lots of copies of your data. In and of itself, that's not a problem if they are what you want your business to be doing with the data. What is a problem is when you lose track of those copies or they get used for incorrect purposes or you don't have the ability to audit their use. So as we get more into a litigious environment and we have a GDPR requirement, we have a SOX requirement, we have whatever you're governed by, the ability to make sure you are discovering against all of the copies of your data and that all of the copies of your data are governed at the right level is growing and more and more important to you. So why are we in this space and why are we in this space now? There are a number of things here. One of them is truly what's on this slide. There are parts of what I'm gonna talk about that are we want to cover all of your copy management solutions on our kit and not on our kit, providing you the, the discovery side of this based on your intent-based policy management. And then the other side of that is for the things that are specifically on our kit, there were things that we used to do that were pretty challenging to consume. And now that we have an orchestration engine that very easily expresses your intent-based management policies, we can orchestrate them in a very consumable and easy to provision way. So copy data management as a product set means a lot of things to a lot of different people. For some, it is strictly a snapshot management on their array or in their, in their environments. For some, it is the golden copy into their Dev and QA or the golden copy at their DR site. For some, it is the reporting copy. For us, it is truly all of the copies of data that you are going to make. That includes the operational recovery, either array mediated copies of that or traditional or semi-traditional backups of your production data and your dev data and your QA data and everything you choose to back up. It's the operational recovery, it's the DR, it's the HA, it's the discovery, it's the repurposed copies. All of that space is what we're looking at when we're talking about copy data management. And just to be clear, you're talking about this across not just Hitachi product, but other product, other locations? Yes. So local copies. Local copies, remote copies. Uh, Public cloud. Pushing out to public cloud, yes. Initial focuses on, um, well, HDID has been around for quite a while. Um, its focus as a copy data management product and not just an orchestrator of our storage products is, is newer. So the scope going beyond the data center into public cloud, we have some functionalities there. We'll run components of this for you. If you choose, you can run these components in AWS and anywhere that we've got uh, VMs that we can run that, that match our specs, which are pretty easy. Uh, so yes, we can do some data management inside the public cloud. We don't do everything yet. I'm not gonna manage uh, snapshots in AWS yet, but the, the framework that we're gonna talk about is there for that. So if you, could, if you can't manage snaps in AWS, what are you going to run it in AWS for? Um, let me get a few slides out. All right. And then I'll, I'll say, here's a spot where something that I'm sending from here to there makes sense as a, how do I protect cross environments? 
Um, so when I start talking about copy data management, I pillar things into three buckets. So the first one of those is recovery copy services. We look at this space as being the, the operational recovery, the backup and restore space. The, I'm gonna do this all the time. The HA, our global active device, you've heard it mentioned a couple times, active active clustering of storage arrays at metro kind of distances, disaster recovery with asynchronous remote replication, uh, layering on snapshots on all sides of those environments. Traditional, uh, traditional, I say it's our traditional is a little bit different than other traditionals, but backup to a disk repository for things that aren't running on our kit so that I can't snapshot, you know, I don't know how to snapshot every other vendor in the environment. So I'll do, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I will be managing the protection of those applications, uh, just not all of it mediated by the array-based replication products. I put all of that in my recovery copy services bucket. I also have an agile copy services bucket, and that's all of my repurposing workflows. Everywhere I wanna take a copy of production data, maybe scrub out PII, and then put it in a dev environment. Or I wanna take a, a copy of production data and run it through my analytics for business process, whatever I'm gonna do with that analytics environment. All of those repurposing, and how do I streamline the refresh into those environments we do inside the orchestration engine with Agile copy services. And then our third bucket is governance. And how do we provide an e-discovery with full index and search of the data itself all in the same framework? When you do say index and search, how are you doing index and search just as one data point? Uh, so one data point that I'm gonna demo in a few minutes is for non-structured files, taking what would be a traditional backup of them, tiering it into our object store in native format, and then using a content intelligence, which is gonna be the next presenter, it's gonna include in there, going in native format and then having a content intelligence product that can look at my backup stream as well as other streams that feed my object store and give you a full native query index, intelligent view of that data from what was in the backup, what's in what other reasons that I have data in my object store, a single view at that whole set. So that's one way that we're doing it. And, and all the long-term retention things we would traditionally call archive, you're putting into governance? So archive, I always think of archive as stub and move. I'm gonna do long-term retention. I'll put those into my object store as well, but I, I count them still in my recovery copy services because I am doing a recovery after, even if it is a seven-year-old recovery, I may be recovering a long-term retention. I, I would argue you don't recover from an archive, you retrieve from an archive. I would, I would agree. Um, been called ILM. Then we start getting into the semantics of yeah, but when is it an archive versus when is it just a long-term store? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. So there are gonna be two personalities of HDID that I'm gonna talk about. One of them that is truly the storage orchestration pieces, places where I am facilitating data movement with array-based replication products, and one where I'm not. In the not, I'm looking at maybe smaller data sets, maybe mid to long-term retention, maybe unstructured data, a variety of application mixes, um, hyper-converged environments play nicely here. If you unfortunately own other people's storage arrays, we play in this space. And what HDID will do for you there, I, I say traditional backup, and this is why it's not traditional backup. For us, it is always an incremental forever. Uh, we're doing you know, block level change or file level change in some scenarios. We can do somewhat traditional batch, you know, <laughs> nightly backup or every couple hours backup. In some environments, we'll actually do a live data mover, and we can do a continuous data protection operation in Windows environments for short retention spaces where you could say, I wanna go back four minutes, I wanna go back five minutes, I wanna go back seven minutes. 
Um, so that that level of protection uh, is in place there. How short is short? Because minutes. Um, you don't know yeah. that you want to restore Our, yeah. seven. For, for CDP, you're not going to run 14 days. No, but we'll gonna... layer CDP on with a live protection or as a cascade. And, and so you may do CDP for six hours, 12 hours, and then go to hourly hours. RPO, something like that. So I can do 24 hours? Uh, it's a matter of <laughs> are you willing to dedicate the space? Yeah, to I need the journal space. Then yes. Okay. Yep. So recovery copy services include restore. We also have the agile piece of this. Restore out of place in this space is also a, a methodology that we can do an orchestrated recovery of that application somewhere else, into dev, into QA, whatever that may be. I'm going to go really fast because I know we're way behind. So. I know you guys won't be shy and jump in on me. Um, getting it off site, everything is, we continue that incremental forever space. So we are doing block level changes amongst those. We can change retentions as we do this. We can do live backup to catch every bit as it comes in, dropping the burstiness of a link. If I'm doing small remote office kind of backups over a small pipe, I could do a live protection on the front end in a batch overnight. So I might have a two hour RPO with things coming in all the time to my short term repository. And then a, a one day backup that goes off site and is held for a longer time. And then the piece that I'm going to talk about demoing is where we get into the governance copy and goes to your question, Tim, about how do I do this? Um, I'm sending native file system data individual files as objects into our object store, and then we're adding custom metadata around them. What that ends up looking like is that unstructured data comes into HDID and is retained as it would be based on your object level policy, your, your backup policy. And we tier it into our object store, and HDID puts on some level of metadata around that. What is this file? Where did it come from? When did it change? You know, the, the normal POSIX y kind of stuff. Nothing incredibly interesting there. What gets very interesting is when we have the content intelligence product come through afterwards and do a full index of that. And we get to utilize the features of our object store to greatly add metadata around what's there. So you can detect as backups come in hey, this looks like it has social security numbers in it. No one from this source is supposed to have social security numbers in their data. Email off the compliance officer. Or when a user from EMEA says she wants to be forgotten, how do I discover all of her data and make sure that I found every copy of it, not just the backup stuff, which HCI is going to have indexed off here, but it'll also reach everywhere else that we have data around and find all of her instances and report them up to one space. So product decision question. Yep. When is that latter solution used when it's not in combination with your copy data management? The solution? content intelligence? Yeah. That's the next presenter. Mm -hmm. So he'll give you a, a whole set of reasons. John will, the other John will, will give you a whole bunch of why you'd have HCI on its own, mm -hmm. or not necessarily on its own, but without me. Um, but with me, it gives you visibility into here. And one of the things that we like about it from the copy data management side is when you have that e-discovery requirement, you're not taxing the backup or data mover requirement either. So I can continue, I can size for what I need to do to support ingest and recovery kind of workloads and not have to handle the full index and search come in that is a part of a large discovery. So I guess from an architecture perspective, when I'm comparing modern backup solutions, this is kind of a this is considered, I think, table stakes doing been able to search metadata of stuff that I've placed in archive. Yes. So without yes. this add-on solution, I don't get that.
capability? Um, you get some of the capability. We yep, don't. But with with HCI, you get full text search. Yes, it's so content, not just metadata. If you if you wanted to do traditional, show me all of the backups for this source, uh -huh. and I want to restore this file. Of course, that's there. Okay. But if you want to say, Sally Jones wants to know everywhere that the, her social security number showed up, you don't go here. That HR you go to complaint HCI. against, if I want to search <laughs> HR complaint against how yes. it marks. Yes, okay. you do that. But that and, would give you way too we'll much find data. And yeah, that'll find it everywhere. Too much data. Yeah. Point oh, bring the system grinding, grinding. So that's the, that part. Now we get to see it. So this is HDID. Um, this is the UI to HDID. Everything in this UI is actually Content making REST API calls to the core product itself. We publish the API to you. So as a developer, you can create policies, apply policies onto nodes, trigger backups, trigger restores, do all of the work. That's very slick and cool. It's also very slick and cool because HID that we talked a whole bunch about is building a whole lot of workflows around data protection kind of work that just call H did. Including at one point earlier today we talked about, well, once you get moved onto a new array, it's time to buy a new array and move on to that one. Our non-disruptive migration capabilities utilize our array-based HA non-disruptive, highly available, active-active uh, replication, and we're going to be driving that from HAD and HD. So land on a dashboard, things that you might care about up front, green, yellow, red, uh, obvious spaces. Configuration options down the left-hand side. Nodes are things in your environment. They might be servers. They might be hypervisors. They might be arrays. They might be cloud targets. Policies are truly policy. They are your, your desired set of operations that you're going to do for a set of data. So that might be my intent is for my platinum level workloads to have HA with one hour RPOs and a dev copy that is fully separated from the production environment. That policy you could then apply to a number of nodes in what we call a data flow. Data flow is application of policy. So I'm going to look at a policy I already have in place. Can I get a list view instead of tiles? Of course. I'm you don't have to demonstrate it. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You can get a list view instead of tiles. I, it's like every, um, everybody loves tiles till they have 5,000 objects to manage. So one of the items that came, uh, this is HDID 6.5 and HDID 6.0. Uh, when we introduced the REST API and this, this front GUI, we gave you that option as well as instant sort and filter uh, because some of our largest customers were saying that, your tiles are great, just, but just I got 10,000 of them, so, yeah. yep. Yes, of course. Um, how do you select what you're going to protect? Your policy is based on some level of what am I going against. Here I'm doing an OS path. Um, I have a variety of op options. I can do it based on application. I can do it on physical resources. I can do it on hypervisor and things inside that hypervisor. I picked a path. Um, it's just a path on one of my servers. Then I get to select the operations that I might choose as part of my policy. Um, they can be backup operations, CDP operations. If I'm doing that repurposing workflow, I'm likely going to want to mount the target of whatever I was doing onto a server, pre and post scripting around PII scrubs. Uh, or around starting and stopping the applications that are a part of that. Do you guys do the PII scrub or am I calling something? We give you a hook. 
We don't. Uh, do, we don't actually do so the you're, scrub itself. You're, you're saying I want to scrub. Call this script. Call this script. Okay. Uh, replicate for on or off prem in the host-based data movement that we're looking at right now. Uh, that's also where I'm going to call my array-based replication tools as well. Uh, snapshot being the space efficient point in times so that we're going to do inside the array. And then tiering is what I'm going to show as well here where I'm actually sending a, that full version of the data into the object store. So in my policy, I have included a short term backup. You'll note in HDID, we really are looking at service level direction, your intent of what should be protected. So my short term backup, I said I'm going to run it on an RPO and a schedule. The RPO is every eight hours I want to have a protection point. If your admin comes in at one o'clock in the afternoon and triggers it, I'm going to go at nine o'clock that night. I like to chew things up, so at midnight I'm going to run it again because my policy is every eight hours and at midnight. So that I go back to what I consider a normal schedule. But if you've got a reason to run it somewhere in between and you trigger it, I'll just reset. Uh, yeah, maybe I missed something. Are you considering HDID as a replacement for, I'll call it traditional backup software? Uh, for some use cases, HDID is a replacement for that. And it goes into that recovery copy services. Uh, for some, I mean, there are certainly, there's, there's a place for TSM, for net backup, for Commvault, for, for the large traditionals. But when you're looking at the modern data protection options, the, the other competitors I'd rather not name, um, yes. Do you have something like instant recovery things? Yeah. Where you can actually run the VM against a copy? So when we are doing the, the second demo that I'm going to run, where I'm doing it off array-based mediated products, we do that today. Um, here in the host-based mediated where I'm doing data movement, we don't run it against our repository because that repository might be off-prem, it might be in uh, a long-term object store, so we, don't, we do the data movement and then we do the recovery. But in the, in the storage mediated, yes, we very much do. We'll actually mount your snapshot back to ESX and move the data power on the VM and vMotion back. So I build out my policy. And once that policy is all set, I'll actually go and apply it via data flow. Um, as a UI, HDID really gives you the drag and drop and the, the <coughs> wireframe diagram of what I'm looking to do. When you're doing this at the scale of 10,000 nodes, you're going to build this via the APIs. And they're, you know, it's a very consumable way to do it. We have this running that was generated by API. We also do it manually the first times to just show you how it's done. Um, all through here, I, you know, when I actually edit this data flow, and start working. When I drag a node into the area where I'm working, I see all the policies that I have in my environment that applies to that kind of node. And then I start applying them. And when I've completed all of the objects in my policy, so I had a short-term backup, a long-term okay, backup, you, you and a tiering. You just clicked on three objects. We have no idea what they are. I have. So, so you, we've got a policy. We've got a data source. We've got a data sync. Right. So you have, a, you have a policy, which is your intent. What do I want to do as a service level? You have a node, which is something I apply a policy to. I have a server in my case. Calcium is a node in my environment. I'm applying a policy to it. And that policy included a short-term backup to a repository, a long-term backup that then tiered into my object store. Okay. That node plus policy, as I apply policy to nodes, I do that in a data flow, which so, is where we are here. So you didn't open the, the long-term policy box back. Don't do it now. OK. What's the difference between a short-term and a long-term policy? Isn't That's not just retention, it's also location? It was, it, in my definition of this policy, 
no, there no, no, was you know, retention. Can... In HDID parlance, there is no difference. It is what you determine what your intent is for short term versus long term, for on prem versus off prem. In the HDID policy that I created, both of them were backup operations. One has a shorter retention, the other has a longer retention. I'm applying one locally but, and one but remote. You'll but you'll present the load to the data source twice, once for the long term and once for the short term? No. OK. So as I draw my data flow, what I did for my RPOs in my policy, I had an eight-hour RPO on my short term and a short retention. I think it was a couple days. My long term, I had a one day RPO and a longer retention that tiered into my object store. The, the longer term one that has an RPO that was multiples of the shorter term one will actually just do a resync of the current. You know, so if, if I do my short term at eight and you know, I, I have my, or midnight and I started at midnight, if I do my midnight, and then I do it at 8 a.m. and I go again, and I go again, and I re-up at midnight. When I hit my one day RPO on the long term, I will grab the current state from the short term and move it over. So I'm not going back to the source again. I'm doing a smart resync based on what your current data set looks like. Okay, and if the short term is a snapshot, you'll mount the snapshot. Yep. Okay. Or if I'm doing, if I'm using array-based mediation, I'll probably have an HA picture and I'll just take snapshots at each side instead of having to do a copy. But I could certainly do a short-term retention based on snapshots, mount those and, and copy them into the object store, yes. So once I've, once I've filled all this out, um, there's a rules compiler to make sure that what you've done makes sense and it is, it is a valid policy. It gets deployed. And then you can go monitor what's happening in your environment. So, oops, wrong one. So we were looking at this where I can select the node up at the top and if I were an admin and I was about to do something odd on Calcium, I could say protect it now instead of waiting for the next backup window to happen. I'll dial up my logging and see, you know, it, it runs through and shows me all the things that happened. Or if I want to stay at a higher level, I can just rely on, hey, my backup completed. It didn't throw any errors. Things are good. At this point, I have the option to go, you know, I can go through all the restore options. They are what you would expect. I can also look at the storage that ended up being being stored. Here's the part I really wanted to show you guys because it, it includes populating the object store in its native format. So I'm going to go into the tier level, which was that last chain of my data store. I called it tiering into the object store. And this policy, the, the repository bits for this, include a UUID that is the bucket name in our object store. So you'll have to take my, take it on faith that this whole long number that ends in D3F is the same as this whole long number that ends in D3F. So in our object store, I've got a view of a whole bunch of objects that came in and space usage that was on them. And I'm going to show you the built into the object store simple search. And we'll have a demo of the HCI that gives you the really valuable search afterwards. So so. Are the files a separate object then? Each file is going in as an object. We've got huge scalability in our object store. So every file goes in as its original file type, uh, lands in. We stick some system data around it. So I'm doing a simple search like. I want something that's named password and is of type file as opposed to an object that has the metadata about that file. And I, I, I gave it a path as well. And, and if it's a snapshot of a LUN, then, so then, then the, you're taking each one of those snapshots as a separate object as well? This is for the 
network mediated, um, not snapshot based. This is currently for unstructured data, file system data. Roadmap, we can talk about later, about things that I'm going to be moving and how I'm going to move them. Okay. Today's iteration of this is unstructured data, uh, okay. file data. This meaning the product? Yes. HDID's current functionality for bringing is, data is into for the files. object store. Oh, is, into the object. Into the object store is for file system unstructured data. And for object store, the, I can use the Hitachi object store or... Today's implementation is going into Hitachi's HCP object store. Again, today's implementation live on camera is today's implementation is the unstructured data into the object store. No snaps, no snapshots. Not snapshots into the object store. Snapshots, definitely. Snapshots can be mounted and backed up to the repository if that snapshot contains file system data, you can certainly send it into the repository tiered into the object store, but I don't have a single flow that says snapshot, catalog all the data into the object store in one bucket in this release. And, and what do you mean by repository? Yeah, so the uh, HDID has, its, uh, has a disk-based repository that is the, that short-term target, that's HDID. He is his own repository. So this is a hardware product? It's software. It'll run on whatever. And that's where we so, get to the, so what how do we want to run this? storage can I the use object. for the repository? Sorry, what? What storage can I use for the repository? Can that be a data domain? Can that be a NetApp? Can that be anything? Or is it a VSP? It can be anything local to the nodes that you run it on. So if, it is, if it's a Linux or a Windows box or what support our repository code, that could be a VM with VMDK storage. That could be a box that you provide with internal storage or a LUN from any array anywhere. So that could storage. be a VM in AWS as the repository. And, there, and I think I want to make sure we, we capture that it's not a target file system, so not NFS, but it a is, block storage. It is. Um, so if I have a Linux machine with a mounted NFS, NFS file system. You can run it that way. Okay. Because we land things as files in there. They are not directly available to you in the repository today. So you can't mount the repo outside of HDID space and, and pull things out. Yeah, but I can't do that with a net backup. Correct. Repository yeah. either. So the difference is when we put things into the object store, they're not wrappered. Yeah. They are not we, containerized. We got, so you do have got when access you, we, to come we, in and say, hey, I'll click on that object. And turns out that that really is Etsy password from wherever this was. So you have the data here. So lots of things that can be done here. Obviously, the e-discovery use case is valid, uh, but I'm also moving data to the object store. The object store today is HCP, but it won't always be only HCP. So as a data mover from traditional file systems to an object store, HDID has a place that it can play here. So I'm running low on time, so I'm going to flip back to my slides. Um, and talk about some of the array mediated features that come in as well. So for the very large data sets, for the critical applications that are running on our kit, we have, we have always had fantastic replication or products. We have not had easily consumable replication management. So there were traditionally two ways of configuring our replication. One of them was our kind of static replication manager GUI, um, which was full featured, but slow, slow to interact with. It was very prescriptive, this to that, to that, to that, um, and lots of clicks. 
The other way was very, very powerful and had a very, very steep learning curve. That was the scriptable interface that was our command and control interface. Uh, people that have used Hitachi Kit for a long time will tell you that Horcum is their enemy. They, they, or they love it, but it, they love it because it was powerful and they've forgotten that it was hard to learn. H did. <laughs> Storage. I was a user. I loved it. Storage uh, guys like stuff that's hard to. Yeah, you know, I, that's hard to learn. I took it, it helps great protect pride our feet in, in being good at it. Um, but it, it's not easy. And it's, it's easy to make mistakes when you're managing something that's very challenging to use. So, what HDID does is it goes back to that framework of saying, you tell me what you wanted to have happen. You want Oracle to have snapshots. And now I will instantly create snapshots that match up against Oracle, not against LUN 12345, but Oracle's data files are on in this ASM disk group, and I will discover the storage that they're on, and I will orchestrate that protection for you. And when you want to do a restore, I will recover that snapshot onto the production volumes instantaneously, and you restart your application. And when I don't have space on the volume to hold the snapshot, you'll page me and tell me? When my pool is filling, my HIAA will alert and warn you, and we will recover. Uh, we will preemptively automate adding space into that pool so you don't run out of space. Yes. Uh, OK, HIAA, that's another product? That, the infrastructure analytics that we learned about earlier today will notice that there are things anomalous in your environment and will trigger an HAD workflow to ensure that you don't run out of space. I'm out of space. I, <laughs> there are no more disks for you to allocate. So if you I am absolutely the backup, run out of space. I am space, the backup I, administrator. I want to be told that that snapshot failed. And you will. OK. Yeah. yeah. So in the demo, when we go back into the demo, I'll show you where I have the alerting. So we will alert as pools start to fill. We will alert when things do fail. Um, so you'll, you'll absolutely know when things are going to have problems. Um, on the recovery copy services side, of course, we can provision and orchestrate the remote replication as well, combining the local and the remote protection. Um, and then we can drive the, the repurposing workflows like we've been talking about, including the hooks, admittedly not the integrated scrubs, but hooks for your scrubbing utilities for your applications. When we look at HDID, and I'm, I'm asking you to bring all of your copy services into this one umbrella, I'm aware that you probably don't have one set of admins that are responsible for all of it. So one of the things that HDID does very, very well is very granular role-based access control. So you could choose to have your backup admin see all the snapshots, but not be able to fail over to the DR copy. Uh, you may leave that to the app admins, or you may say the app admins are allowed to trigger their backups and their restores, but they're not allowed to configure them. You can do very granular role-based access control inside of HDID. And I mentioned at one point that we orchestrate the recovery or the, the protection and we're not configuring it statically. So if you deploy agents, we can discover those applications and configure the protection to meet what your policy intent was. So if you say protect Oracle, and the ASM disk group goes from five LUNs to 10 LUNs because you went into ServiceNow and triggered the workflow to grow the Oracle environment, and your Oracle environment included global active device to have a stretched rack cluster that's highly available across your two data centers that are close. H did. The next time he looks at Oracle, because you asked for a one hour RPO and he's going to snapshot that, he's going to discover that it went from five LUNs to 10 LUNs and provision them into the same how, policy. How is had. he going to discover that? I've got the is agent he... running on the environment. On, he, on the Oracle server. On the Oracle server. And that's, that's how all I'm going to do. So I will quiesce the database to get you a consistent copy. I will discover the storage that I'm running on. I will provision it into the environment. I will get my HA copy up and present it back to you. So the whole environment 
protects to your desired state as opposed to being configured to it. And then on the recovery side, you know, going back to Oracle as an example, if that environment has a problem, I can revert back to that one hour ago snapshot and then reach out to your uh, RMAN log backups to apply them and come forward to one minute ago when the last transaction finished. All inside of HDID as part of the recovery services that are provided to you. In my Oracle DBA, I'd never go for that. Okay. What does your Oracle DBA use now? RMAN. RMAN. Yeah, Only that, RMAN? Don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But kind Storage of. guys and D Oracle DBAs are natural enemies. We've noticed that, but when your RMAN level zero takes four days because you're running on a 40 terabyte database. My Oracle another DBA tells me there's no other way to solve that and Oracle will kill him and the company will go out of business if we try anything else. Which is why Flashblade. Which is DBA why I is very Oracle powerful. DBAs. How do you really feel? You don't have any feelings about it. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Sworn enemies. So I'm going to do a, a quick demo on VMware. Um, one of the items that we do in the VMware space is the integration into ESX allows us to have policy-based management where the VM admin never has to leave ESX. They just have to know which level of policy they want to have. So you may end up with platinum, gold, and silver, or platinum, gold, and bronze um, service level objectives. And as a VM admin, I know that if I apply this tag, or I name the VM this way, or I put it in this VAP, or it's in this data center, it's in this cluster, it's in this location, it's anything that we can discover about the environment, the HDID policy can be based on that. So I can have my intent-based policy say, if it's tagged platinum, VMware Metro Storage Cluster. If it's, yeah, so if it's tagged platinum, protect it with GAD, VMware Metro Storage Cluster. Do a VADP backup that I hold on to a week. Do an offsite one that I hold on to for other amounts of time. Do snapshots that I do more frequently. So I, I can do policy based management and provision that inside of HDID based on things that I discover about your environment. So HDID runs as a a VM in that environment then, is that? Uh, we need to be able to log into ESX, so you provide us credentials, and we have a server somewhere, it might be a VM in that environment, it might just be a physical box but you elsewhere. Don't have a, you don't have an HDID appliance of some type or anything like that? Uh, not today, no. Yeah, so right now it's credentials. You give us access into ESX, we'll go and discover. And we'll do VADP backups, we'll QE SVMs and snapshot them, we'll, we'll do all of that protection just based on access. So what that looks like, I'm going to start from scratch here just because you know, there's a surprising, uh, there, there's countervailing trends going on in the industry. I see a lot of companies uh, disinvesting their data protection products. And, and, and there are some companies like yourselves that it seem to be investing in data protection products. I mean, why do you, why do you think it's, an, uh, it's uh, something that makes a lot of sense from your perspective? I, you know, copy data management is one thing, but, you know, data protection is, uh, is a step beyond that. Well, I think Mike, but I think uh, uh, here. Uh, hang on a second. Ooh, ooh. Just sharing is caring. Here. Sharing is caring. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to give. This is, Stephen does quick speak anyway. All right. So uh, I think a few things. If we go all the way back to that idea of store, you know, enrich access, it, we need to be the guardians of that data. So if someone's coming to us for whether it's an IT solution or some vertically integrated thing that's running on data. If we don't have the technology to protect it in the right way, we don't look like we're filling all that story out. So I mean, I think from a strategy perspective, we need to own all those pieces. Um, or we need to at least have a solution for the customer who expects us to check all the protection boxes. And 
again, we are focused in this room today on sort of data center modernization, take that phrase for what it is, right? Values on what can we do with the infrastructure folks? But when you also get into data governance conversations, when you can take a product that's intended for data protection but bring in-kind solutions for analytics, how do we, you know, when we're having those other conversations Hitachi's having with their customers, all of a sudden not looking at this backup data as lost to the analytics folks or, you know, not usable, making that available. I think there's a lot of ways that this benefits that overall strategy of how are we going to enrich that data, how are we going to activate it more, not leave it static. It's just it's a piece of the story. I think the challenge is maintaining a bit of excellence across so many dimensions is, is, is a significant challenge. I mean, you obviously have storage expertise, you obviously have object storage expertise, block file, et cetera, et cetera. Adding data protection to that game just becomes uh, yet another portion that you have to maintain, you know, a state-of-the-art cap capabilities, which is, you know, it's just a question of where you want to spend those dollars, I guess. And I, I think for us, um, well, I'll be the first to tell you we're not going after everything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that we have the best Sybase on HPUX offering. We, well, there's focused, two customers you lost. Yeah, we focused on the real core of what our large customers are, and the the things that I, I was talking about most recently, where we're looking at the replication integrated pieces. We needed a way to orchestrate that setup anyway, and so once we've done that, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but great once we, thing. yeah, so <laughs> but once we've done that, adding in a quiesce before a snapshot instead of just having a snapshot, and then it's a backup. If I can index it and I can have it on site and off site, and I can recover from it. It's kind, of like saying, it's kind of like saying backup is archive. It's just a different different level of retention. It's not. It's different. No, it, there are different things that are required there. Snapshot is not backup. Trust me. Oh, no. <laughs> Never had this Don't conversation. Right? Snapshot catalog. So as an operational recovery mechanism, a snapshot can function very well to give you a fast restore in an operational recovery scenario. And that is what we're providing with our snapshot integration that is tied into the applications that we support. We can do that locally and remotely, giving you on and off site operational recovery with retention. And whether we call that a backup or not is a semantic discussion that we can have over beer. Uh, but in my minute 40, I'm going to quickly <laughs> look at what we do in the VMware space, just so that everyone can see um, how we do our integration there. So here are all of the items that I was talking about previously. Any way that I want to look at having my discovery of what I'm protecting under the service level is, is what I'm going to do here. So I might say it's by VM folder. It might be by actual discovery of uh, data center or host or cluster or, or tag inside of ESX. Um, because I don't have any of my VMs tagged and I'm, it's faster for me than uh, guessing at what they are called, I'm going to actually browse for them and I'm going to just grab a VM. So reach out into ESX, log in, discover all the VMs, show me what's there. And I'll pick Calcium because he's been our favorite demo target so far today. Um, that could have been anything that starts with C. That could have been anything in my production cluster. That could have been anything in this data store cluster. However I wanted to find them, I find them. And then for operations, I might say this is replication and I want it to be VMware Metro Storage Cluster. So I'm going to make this a global active device, active active cluster. And I want to have snapshots of that environment that are hardware based, so thin image snapshots on the array, every eight hours hold on to it for a week, quiesce the VM ahead of time. So use VM tools, 
do a VADP backup inside of ESX to get it static before I snapshot the data store that it's running on, then release that VADP backup up in the, in, in the cluster. I'll do that on one side, and then I'll do it remote as well. Again, policy, not application. That was a reusable object that we just created. When I go apply it, it becomes something that is running in the real world. So, do a quick data flow. And grab my ESX environment. Do snapshots for locally. Pick a pool to, to put them on. Identify the remote array that I'm going to be using my global active device with. Select it. Configure the item that I call VMware Metro Storage Cluster, so that's going to be an active active remote clone. Create a new configuration. If you already built an environment doing the older methods for managing, we can take it over. So I could say adopt something that's already out there and it should will go and discover it. Instead I can say create something new. Um, pick a quorum device, pick a pool, all of that kind of work. I have to pick a quorum and I don't have a quorum. So I'm going to change this on the fly and make it just a true copy environment where I have a pool. And then on that remote site, I also said I want to do snapshots. Once I've built my new space, I run my rules compiler. And I went really fast there, so I'm pretty sure there were things I missed. And I did. Um, so it tells me that what I drew out doesn't make sense. If it had worked, if I had filled all the right boxes, um, I'd have success. Hitting go would actually discover the data stores that that VM was running on, provision secondary devices in the other array, build the global active device VMware Metro storage cluster, do the presentation, do the discovery, and then start the clock on the snapshots locally and remotely. 